today, as I mentioned earlier, we are starting a series that I introduced you to two weeks ago I called Real Life Survivors. The Bible is our, text, is our textbook for life. And the Bible has example after example after example of people who experienced suffering but weren't overcome by it. You have people like Noah, Moses, Job, David, and Paul, just to name a few, who experienced real hard times, but they weren't defeated by it. They were real life survivors. But you know, the Bible's not the only place we can look to for real life survivors. We have real life survivors living among us today. They, they live in our neighborhoods, they work with us, they go to school with us, some of them even go to, they go to church with us. They are people who have experienced the grace and mercy of God, and they have overcome their times of testing. And as a result, they have a timeless testimony, just like the people in the Bible have a timeless testimony. I mean, we're still talking about their testimony today. Even though it happened years and years ago, we're still talking about what God did in their life today. And the same holds true with the people that live among us who are real life survivors. They have a timeless testimony. A testimony that I believe um, can help us during our time of testing. We can draw strength and comfort and encouragement to know that when we face hard times, we can, we can overcome, we can survive. One of the main scriptures for this series is, is Romans 8.37. And it says, in all these things... We are more than conquerors through Him who loves us. Through Jesus Christ, we are super conquerors. There's nothing that we will ever face that we can't overcome. We are, we can survive. And so today, I'm so happy uh, to be able to uh, introduce uh, two real-life survivors Brian and Delana right now. So would you make them feel welcome as they join me on this stage? series. I'm looking forward to it. I'm, I know bits and pieces of your survivor story, but I don't know all of it, and so I'm really anxious to, to hear it today. I know that everybody here is, is as well. But before we get into the specifics of your survivor story, I thought it might be a nice idea for, for us to get to know you just a little bit better than we, than we do. And so um, I thought maybe it would be good if you shared things like where you grew up, how many children you have, how many children you plan on having. Yeah. <laughs> we won't answer the latter. <laughs> Favorite thing to do in your free time, anything along those lines. Um, my name is Delana Ragnauer, and I grew up in Sedalia, Missouri, just a couple hours north of here. Um, I, had, I was blessed to have Christian parents um, that were first generation, maybe, Christians in their families then. Um, maybe their parents were Christian, but they didn't take them to church or bring them up with the Lord. And, and I know my dad's grandmother was not saved until she was, um, until after, right before I was born, I think. So um, we did, do have a Christian heritage now because we've seen a lot of people come to the Lord in my family, but um, at that time, my parents were saved through some friends of theirs, um, introducing them to Jesus before I was born. So, how lucky is that for me? So, we grew up, um, 
I don't, I don't remember going to church until I was a little bit older um, kid, and I really loved it. I loved um, learning how to worship the God that we served and um, learning about him in the Bible. We have five children, um, Noah, Nathan, Jonah, Aaliyah, and Abby, and they are 11, 9, just turned 8, and 5, I don't know, and 10. <laughs> And um, and we were teachers. We were married for how long before we had kids? Seven, eight years. Um, so we enjoyed life together for a little while. And we tried to have children, and we um, it was very difficult. We lost a couple. Um, so we were so thrilled to have a family, and um, really feel like God has blessed us. My name is Brian Wright Miller. Covered a lot of bases. Um, Delane and I met at Southwest Baptist University. Uh, we were married in 1994, December of 1994, so it'll be 20 years this year. Um, as she said, we have five kids. Um, God is truly, truly blessed in that. And uh, what else? I'll just anything you want to share. I have been. How many uh, kids are going to have? <laughs> I've been in ministry for. <laughs> For almost 20 years now, uh, currently I'm serving at North Mixed Baptist Church as the uh, youth and children's pastor. I've been there at the 11 years in April, and um, I think it's good. I think it's good. Okay. And I think it's good that you were at North Mixed. Um, I've known Brian and Delane, I guess. I knew them, got acquainted with them before Noah was uh, was born. We came together. I pastored in Highland Hill. He's a youth pastor at, at North Mixed. And we came together to do a youth walk-in. Um, we did that every year, I guess, after that. Um, but you were you were expecting Noah when I first when I first met you. Now Brian and I actually go back farther than that. We just didn't really make the connection. Um, he was from Monad. I was from Marionville. He worked for Wheeler Furniture. I worked for Wheeler Furniture. So we had that connection uh, going on. Went to school uh, about the same time. He's a little bit older than me, but not, not much. Um, but um, Melissa and I are married today um, in part because Brian was very sensitive to the Lord and uh, had, a, had a Bible study on uh, Tuesday night that I was able to come to, and, and that's where I met Melissa. So uh, very, very thankful that he heard God and, um, and that I was able to be a part of that. Brian and Elena were both in our, in our wedding, so they're dear friends uh, to us, and we, we love them so much. So uh, let's get to your survivor story. Uh, we're calling your survivor story, uh, Survivors of a Child, a Life Threatening Sickness. So let's go back to the day that, all, that it all started. Um, I want you to walk us, if you would, walk us through the initial hours of that day. How did it begin for both of you, and how did it begin uh, for Noah? Um, I, it the morning that all this took place. And this was April 11th. Um, 2011. 2011. Yeah. yeah, we, we, the only thing, like Noah was totally fine. Everything was going fine. He was very healthy up till that point. He'd never had any uh, struggles with illnesses or he'd just get the stomach bug or whatever. And he, he was good. Um, but the week before this happened, the only thing we noticed is we'd look at him and go, Does Noah's face look a little puffy to you? He looks a little swollen. What is that? And so, um, but we asked a friend of ours. He's like, ah, allergies can do weird stuff. Maybe he's fine. So, um, but Monday morning, that was a Monday. He had an appointment in Springfield, um, and Jonah did too to go to the dentist. Yay! And on the way there, we were driving to the dentist's office in Springfield from Ozark, where we lived. And um, he said, "Mom, my chest hurts." It's really hurts and then he said my arm hurts and I said which arm so my left arm and for some reason well we're all like trained <laughs> your yeah. left arm hurts your chest hurts something's wrong with your heart so um, I used my cell phone while I was driving to call uh, the dentist and um, to see you know let them know what was going on um, when we got there the dentist He's a Christian man, and he's um, very kind, and he came out to meet us, 
and he looked at Noah, and when we got out of the car and looked at his chest, um, it was swollen, and it had little spider vein type things that you could see. So we knew that this is something really weird. So um, instead of going to the dentist, I think he's probably grateful, but we went to urgent care instead. And um, of course the doctor was like, this is something that we really want to check him out. And so um, we were there all day long and poor Jonah was stuck with us. And um, so she took tests and all kinds of stuff. and. Um, we knew that, I mean, I knew just going into that day, there's something wrong with my baby, so. Um, Delana called me, I guess about 10 that morning to say that they had detoured to urgent care, so I, uh, I rounded up some child care to come meet us at the, uh, the urgent care in Springfield, and, and that's when they said they started running um, things like EKGs and CAT scans, and, and uh, the, the, the doctor, uh, that was on call that day at the uh, urgent care. Um, you know, I could just see her out of her cubicle, just pouring over this this image, um, and she just kept staring at it and looking at it from different angles. And and finally, she came in and said, um, "I need you guys to pick a regional children's hospital. Uh, you choose either Kansas City Mercy or St. Louis Children's." And you know, whenever a doctor comes in and tells you that, we you know that there's something major going on. Um, she, uh, so almost immediately, I, we really had no experience with either one of the hospitals, but I just immediately St. Louis Children's popped into my head, so I said, we'll go to St. Louis Children's. She said, okay, we'll be flying in there. And so, yeah, tonight. And so you, you know that whenever a person's being life flighted, that you know, there's something major going on. And um, she, uh, she pulled us out into the hall, and said, I found a mass in his chest, and it is pressed up against his heart and his airways, and uh, the reason we don't want to uh, drive him or have you drive him there, um, we don't know how fast acting this is, and we need to get him there as soon as possible. So, uh, you know, at that point, we started calling family, started calling friends, um, you know, people, you know, there are some, some bad things, I guess, about social media, uh, some dangerous things about social media, but I will say it is a perfect way to get the word out quick. And, um, I mean, within seconds, we were able to broadcast around the world um, that we needed prayer support. And so, um, the, uh, the doctor told us, she said, um, now if they bring their jet down, you'll be able to accompany him. If they bring the, the helicopter, you won't be. And so, of course, we were definitely praying that he wouldn't have to make that trip alone. But um, by, uh, by nightfall, uh, they sent the helicopter. Uh, they had a six different medical personnel on this flight. And, uh, you know, we were worried about, well, Noah's going to be scared to death having to do this all by himself. And Noah was like, bye, Mom and Dad, see you there. You know, that was, he was fine. Um, but, uh, so about 8.30, I guess on that night of April 11th, they, they life-flighted him to, uh, to St. Louis Children's. And uh, we, uh, Mom and Dad, and Lane and I, we got into our car. And uh, we made really good time to St. Louis. You know, I really, I, I really believe that uh, angels picked our vehicle up and helped us along. Because my dad, I knew my dad kept looking at the speedometer because I was really going by people quickly. But the speedometer never read me more than about 75 miles an hour. I was only fudging five miles, but we made the trip in two hours and 45 minutes. So uh, that was a God thing. I really believe really it was a God thing. And uh, that's, that's how that day began. So you had a tailwind behind you. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, I don't think I don't remember. I'm thinking that I I found out either you text you sent me a text or I found out um, by Facebook. And you know, like everybody, I mean, it's just shocking when you hear that someone's child is is being wife minded. Um, and and so you you obviously found out right away that it was serious. I mean, this was more than just a routine visit to the 
to the ER, which you have children or urgent care, you're, you're used to making visits there, so you all knew right away that it was, it was something very, very serious. So once you made it to St. Louis, um, I know St. Louis and St. Louis, they do testing all the time. They never, they never shut down, they're 24-7. Um, how long did it take to confirm that that the, the mass was indeed cancer. It's, uh, well, first off, uh, when we arrived at St. Louis Children's, um, the very first person that we met, uh, Noah had immediately been admitted to uh, the pediatric intensive care unit. And um, the very first person that we met was Dr. Amy Barone, um, an oncology doctor. And so, you know, even though I think deep down, when we heard the word mass, we probably thought cancer, but we hadn't said the word. Um, you know, I think cancer should be a four-letter word. Yeah. But, uh, so whenever you, your first doctor you meet is an oncology doctor, that's tough. Because you know then, they expect it to be cancer. And so I guess it was probably two days later that um, we got the official word. Uh, they had done testing, they had, they had discovered, yes, this is cancer, it was called uh, T-cell lymphoma, stage three. Um, and they said, uh, well, we sat down in a conference room, and actually that night it was, um, of course, Elena, myself, my mom and dad, my uh, mother-in-law. We sat down in a conference room with Dr. Barone, and uh, she laid out the, the course of action, and she said, we need to start ASAP. And so she said, which, which path do you want to take? And she gave us options. And, uh, and so within a couple of days, they had identified what it was and began the, uh, the treatment. Do you remember how long uh, you were up there uh, when you first arrived? How long did that first period of time did it last for you? Yeah, we were, he was in intensive care for five, four and a half to five days. And then um, he was moved to a regular room. And uh, the whole time we were gone, there the first visit was 11 days um, and what was very difficult is our next son Nathan had a birthday right in the middle of that so we couldn't come home and he couldn't get there I mean, it was just there were lots of other things going on too hard with the family and then we kept having to come back <laughs> yeah, we'll, yeah. And we'll, uh, we'll get to kind of the, the, the whole process and how long um, did they give you any idea uh, early on? Did they give you any idea at all, you know, what they were saying as far as chances of survival with, with this type of cancer? Well, you know, and I don't know if she told us this just to, to, uh, Travis knows that I have a tendency to be a little high strung at times. <laughs> and so, of course, you know, we wanted the, uh, the best possible option, you know, for Noah. Um, and when she said stage three, I mean, I saw some of your faces out there kind of like gasp, oh, that's horrible. Um, but what she told us was, she said, now, you know, people hear stage three, stage four, and, and they think, oh, stage four is going to be terminal, and stage three is really serious. And um, she said, really, that number only indicates where the mass is located in the body. And so a stage three mass is a little more serious because it was up against the heart. Um, but that night that we... Uh, the night that we chose our course of action, she said, now this will be a two-year course, two years of treatment. And so, you know, man, two years seems like a really long time when you're thinking about my child has cancer, and we've got to fight this thing for two years nonstop. Um, and, you know, I don't think she did give us a... Well, I remember that first night. She said, um, and we believe this is treatable. And when we heard the word treatable, I think we Oh, okay. So, I mean, we knew that that doesn't mean, you know, you have a certain answer, but um, it was nice to hear. And we're going to, like I said, we'll come back to kind of talking about the process that you that you went through, the journey, the travel back and forth, uh, some of the decisions that you had to make along the way. Um, I will say just up front, you know, I think one of the wisest things that you, you did that anybody can do uh, they bathed everything in prayer. Um, I don't know how many times, you know, I either get a text or I would see something on, you know, on Facebook, 
you know, pray for us. I think even when you were when you were uh, faced with the decision of what kind of treatment, what course, I mean, immediately you you again social social media is one of the great things. You immediately you called upon people to pray that God would give you wisdom uh, to make the right decision concerning you know, Noah's Noah's treatment. You know, and I, and, I, and I think that that's one of the wisest things that we can do. When we find ourselves faced with any decision, certainly a decision of that magnitude, we need wisdom. We need, we have knowledge, doctors have knowledge, but they, they need to know how to accurately apply the knowledge that they have to each situation. And obviously, you've never been down that road before. You know, it's totally new. But God, He knew. And, you know, and you saw Him. So, you know, I, I just think throughout the whole process, that's what I saw. I mean, I saw two people who, who were turning to God and, and seeking His face and, and really just asking that everybody involved in the process would have, would have wisdom. How would you, how would the two of you describe your relationship with God um, before you find, found out that Noah had, had cancer? Um, I think I, the church I grew up in was... Um, so good, and the people that uh, taught me and stuff, I can see a genuine love for Jesus, um, and it made a huge impression on me, and so I, I just always loved the Lord and um, His Word, and knew that that was where the answers were, and um, even in my adult journey before that, um, I just wanted to seek his will and try to live the way that he wanted me to live so I don't waste my life and um, I just want to please him. So um, I would go to Bible studies and things like that and um, really feel, I mean we had other rough things happen before that, not of this magnitude, but um, go through some hard times and just learn how to rely on scripture um, for my base and foundation to know that to learn already, I think, before what happened with Noah, that God helped prepare me and Brian to know that um, he is our rock and he's our, um, just a safe place and that his word is sure and that he is faithful. In fact, there was um, something I had gone through before, uh, well, when I had Jonah, he's our third one. Um, so they're all pretty close together. Noah is... 20 months older than Nathan. Nathan is 23 months older than Jonah, so they were very close. And when I had Jonah, um, the week after, I developed pneumonia, and um, then I got pneumonia again, a second time very close to that, and they discovered that it was a bacterial um, thing and never pinpointed the virus, but it was like mono. So I had three little, little, little children, and um, no one was three, so there were three and under, and I had a virus like mono that lasted about a year and a half, and it was brutal, <laughs> and it, it was so hard, and our family was so great, Brian's parents, and my mom, and everybody tried to help, but you still have to live every single day and keep going, and I learned through that time that um, God was my strength, and the verse and passage that talks about um, and that his grace is sufficient for you and his strength is made perfect in weakness and I learned um, how to rely on him when I was weak and just to let him help me and give, give me grace um, to go on and to make it and to match our, my expectations to what my limitations were and I think that was a huge lesson before all this happened with Noah to not expect too much of myself um, because um, sometimes we have limits on us that we can't control. So I learned how to get through things that you can't control um, and know that God can be trusted and he's faithful. <laughs> um, you know, I, I uh, feel like my relationship before was, was relatively strong, growing. Um, of course, you know, being a minister, you're always busy in service and... Um, and this might be jumping the gun a little bit, but but I think, and I'm going to go ahead and share what I learned in. Yeah, this one. Okay. Um, I think one of the key lessons that I learned as we were going through this is um, it was really time to practice what I preached. You know, it's easy 
to tell people who are going through a hard time, oh, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Or, uh, you know, and, and just spout off some kind of verse to encourage them. Um, but, you know, you know, Delaney mentioned that, you know, we, we've had other rough spots, but nothing as great as this. I mean, whenever you find out your child has cancer, that is heart-wrenching. And so you have a, you know, you have a, um, or I have the opportunity now to put into practice what I've been teaching for all these years. And, um, you know, it, I think it makes me definitely more empathetic and sympathetic um, because, you know, now I can say, okay, I, I, I kind of understand where you're coming from. Um, but like I said, once again, it's time to, to put into practice what you've been teaching all those years. And, and, um, and it was a tough lesson. Um, but it was a lesson that obviously God knew that I needed. The, uh, you know, one of the, so there were several verses that, that became such a, an encouragement and, and one of the verses that um, that I remember, pastor, the pastor that I serve with, he, he uses this, this text periodically, and he says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. And I think what happens sometimes is we, um, is we misquote that, and we think it says all things are good, and that's not what it says. It says all things work together for good. Childhood cancer is not good. Uh, it's not a good thing at all. But you know, in, in, in watching what we've gone through over the last couple of years, um, kind of a neat story. Noah was still in the, in the pediatric intensive care and a doctor came in one morning and he was holding a vial. And he said, this is gold. And I, I had no clue what he meant. He said, do you know what this is? I said, no, sir. He said, this is Noah's spinal fluid. He said, this is gold. And I, I said, I still don't understand. He said, you know, most everybody around the globe has cancer cells in the spinal fluid. This is a perfect specimen. There's not a cancer cell there. He said, what I want to do is I want to use this in research for other children who are facing cancer. And of course, obviously, you know, we, we gave that permission. But you know, even three days in, that was a good thing. That was a for good thing. Um, we had opportunities to, uh, you know, to uh, just express our faith that God was going to take care of us through, you know, to the nurses, to the doctors. Um, that was for good. Um, there have been lots of people who, who have read our Facebook posts or the Caring Bridge site that we updated regularly that um, would comment, um, you know, we love reading your story because it's an encouragement to us. That would be a for good. I guess being here this morning is the first opportunity that we've had to sit down in front of a church family to, uh, to share our story. And hopefully this is a for good. So that's kind of what God taught. You were talking, I thought about the verse that says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who comforts us. You know, and he comforts us so that we can be a comfort to other people. And, and I just, you have it down. And there are things that you're qualified. I mean, there's, there's situ life situations now that you are qualified. You can comfort people, uh, not just as a minister, but, but as a Christian with the comfort that you received uh, from God that, that I, I can't. I mean, I can't comfort anyone, really, who's, who's going through uh, something where their child is facing a, a life-threatening sickness. I mean, I, I can point them to the scriptures. I can point them to God, but I can't empathize, I can't empathize with them. You, know? and, and you can empathize with them. And I think that's what God wants us to do with our time to struggle. He wants us to turn around and, and do something good with them. And, uh, and I believe today isn't one of those four good uh, moments. I believe that people are being encouraged uh, by, by what you're sharing uh, today. And, and you know, so many times we find ourselves in difficult situations and we meet people that we would have never met had we not gone through them. 
And I think it's hard for us so many times to, I think God wants us to look, begin to look around and say, why am I in this? Why, who does God want me to be? Who does he want me to minister to? You know, it can be as simple as when I find myself just with a minor illness in the, in the doctor's waiting room. Is there somebody there that I should be, you know, trying to, to, to share God with? And so, I mean, it's just beautiful that, that you recognize God has given you a, he's given you a platform you know, to minister to people uh, in a way that, again, I'll never be able to, uh, but you, you can. And so I think that's a, a beautiful thing. Uh, any other scriptures that you want to want to share? Do you want to wait? Wait wait for those? Uh, I've got one. Um, early on, um, well, we had done uh, lots of different Bible studies, but a few of my favorites are some Beth Moore Bible studies. Um, and I just feel like through some of her teaching that God used that to help prepare me for this um, that we were going through. And so I just wanted to say thank you. So I wrote a letter and um, didn't think that, you know, I might not get that far, but, you know, just to her team to tell them thanks for all that they do and thanks for the Bible teaching and that they try to really help people know God more. And um, Beth Moore wrote me back. And so I have a card at home. Um, and one of the things she shared with me was um, the passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And... The, the whole little passage, but to focus on two different parts, that we are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. And this is a different translation, so it's not like the way that's in my head, you know, persecuted but not abandoned, like that whole thing. Um, but this one, I'll just read this one. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. <clears throat> persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. And then... Um, we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. <clears throat> for we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may be revealed in our body. Um, and then going on down to the bottom, therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, and yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Um, and she said, there's glory at stake here. So um, just keep the faith and hang in there because there's glory at stake. So, And we had a wonderful pastor um, when Brian was first in the ministry. We were first married. And I remember a lot of times he would teach about, you know, none of us are exempt from trials. We're all going to go through them. You don't get to check the, like, easy box. And <laughs> I want to coast on this side. But um, when we go through them, that we always have the choice whether we're going to become bitter or whether we're going to become better and let God do what he wants to do. Because just because you're going through trials is not a guarantee that God is going to be able to do what he wants to do and get the glory. Um, he's only going to get the glory if we can yield to him and um, give it back and say, okay, I trust you, do what you want to do. Or we can become bitter and it will destroy us. Um, so um, I always just wanted to make sure that I was letting God help me um, in my heart and Brian and pray for him that um, we could let God do what he wanted to do and that he would get the glory. So you kind of touched on some of the things that sustained you during uh, your storm. Scripture, prayer. I want to ask, how important was it to be surrounded by other Christians as you went through this storm? Um, yeah. Um, you know, like I said, within just a, a few minutes of finding out that Noah had a mask, we were able to broadcast that on social media. And, uh, you know, within minutes in response, we were getting Facebook messages or text messages from, from all over, the, literally all over the world, um, saying, we're praying, we'll put him on the prayer list. And um, uh, it's... Uh, it's such an encouragement because I can't think of the scripture exactly what it says, but, but the scripture says something to the effect that when we don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit will intercede for us. And you know, even, you know, you think, well, it should be easy to know how to pray whenever your son's got cancer. Well, when, when you're shocked with that news, it's, it's really hard to put your finger on, how do I handle this? What, what do we do here? 
And so it was such an encouragement to know that, that um, of course, you know, our family, having my family there, um, a church family, and then just friends all over the world that were praying, um, that was a source of great comfort. It was. It was huge. And we knew that even when we were not able to pray sometimes, that people were covering us. And I told Brian last night when we were talking a little bit about this, um, how... You know, sometimes you really feel the presence of God. Sometimes you don't. You go through times where you don't really. But in that whole time with Noah in the beginning phases, um, I don't know about Brian, but I just felt this huge, like I could sense his presence with me. Like he's right there going, you know what? I, I know this is scary, but I got this. So you just hang in there and I'm right here. Like I could feel him almost holding our hands, I mean, we're, we're going through this together. So um, I think the prayers of other people made a huge difference that way, I think, and um, just seeking God's will so he could do what he wanted to do with Noah and with us too. Um, and also, um, for me it was a little different because Brian could still, you know, he had to go to work and be around people. And um, in the beginning with Noah, he had so many doctor's appointments and visits, and uh, then his you know, white blood cell counts would get low, and I don't know if you're familiar with other family members or friends with cancer, but sometimes your immune system is so suppressed that you cannot be around people or get out much. Or, um, so we were really isolated for, for a long period of time where um, we weren't going to church, we weren't around people. So being isolated like that sometimes is is difficult because then things are even heavier than they already are. So what made a difference to me in the support system is people that would not just wait till we got there on Sunday and say, oh, we missed you. It's so good to see you. I'd be like, yeah, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I wasn't really that <laughs> hateful, but it was nice. <laughs> I never heard her say blah, blah, blah to anybody. <laughs> it was nice when, um, when people would contact um, me in another way, like I had a friend um, named Summer who we were just acquaintances when this began, but she was awesome, like if she would send me an email message um, sometimes in the morning and you knew that she had a relationship with God because she was getting up to pray or whatever and she'd say, you know, you're on my mind today, I prayed for you today or um, I don't know if this is off base, but I feel like God was kind of telling me to share this with you today or something like that or what do you think about this or so we became really good friends because um, she kept in touch with me and having somebody like keep in touch was really important then because we were so cut off I think from everybody else and Noah felt that way too I think he was stuck at home he couldn't see his friends um, we couldn't go anywhere and he felt miserable because the cancer didn't really make him feel sick but the chemo as you know, going through that with other people is just, it's brutal. So I think what made a difference is when people would reach out and contact us and see how we were doing through either emails or messages or call on the phone, stuff like that. Um, and not just wait till they see you, you know, later. <laughs> I don't know. And there was a friend that would come and do our laundry for the first a couple months. She would just come and get it once a week, take it to her house, do it, fold it, bring it back. I'm like, you are an angel. So <laughs> things like that really mattered. And you weren't able to talk her into continuing to do that. Uh, no, I just, <laughs> she quit. <laughs> you know, I know sometimes um, it's hard to know exactly what to do uh, for someone who is, who is going through a, a struggle. I know even when you got into Sometimes I just didn't even know, I felt helpless sometimes to know what to do, what to say. Um, you know, you don't want to say the wrong thing. Um, and so, you know, there were times, you know, I just, I kind of felt helpless. And, you know, can you give any recommendation? You know, you've been through this, you've seen what other Christians, or other people, Christians, uh, what they did for you during your, your, your struggle. Your, is there any recommendations that you can give to us to help us to know what to do? You know, I noticed, um, especially in the very beginning, you're so focused on your child, uh, people would ask, well, what can we do to help? And honestly, 
we, we, could, we couldn't process it. You know, we, we don't know um, what you can do with Um But you know, like Delana said, the, the church member who came over to our house and did the laundry, that was huge. I mean, at that point, we, we only had four kids. Child care. Oh, my word. We had to take Noah that summer every single day for a little while. To, we had care in Springfield for a couple months. And so Noah and I, we said it was like our job. We got to go to work. So we'd go, and um, it was difficult to get child care because my children were small, and we homeschool. So they don't go to school. So we needed somebody every time I had to take Noah. And that was, it was hard for me to ask people, you know, can you come over and watch my kids again? <laughs> I'm sorry, but um, so anybody that could, um, and we didn't really want to put like a blanket request on Caring Bridge or something, because what if somebody offered and we didn't feel comfortable? You know, I'm sorry, I'm not leaving my kids with you. <laughs> so it was tricky to kind of get that all arranged, and it would have been nice to have people offer. You know, I'm home during the day, even if I, you know, I could have said thanks, but no, but sometimes. Um, I don't know. That, that was a tricky thing. So sometimes child care is... Well, well, and one of the things, too, that that was a huge blessing. Um, in, in the very... Well, just a second. In, in, the very, in the very beginning, we were making lots of trips to St. Louis as well. And after that first 11 days stint that we were separated from the, uh, the three uh, younger ones, um, that was really hard on them. I mean, we didn't tell them bye. And we were gone for 11 days. So uh, we decided at that point, and you know, I think there were some people in the beginning that questioned our wisdom on this, but we decided we wanted to keep the family together as much as possible. And it was going to be a family journey. Um, we made lots of trips to St. Louis, and we couldn't have done it without my dad. And um, just also, yeah, our families were amazing, but uh, also people giving... Um, for for the first while, we did not have to worry about money things. And I know some people get in that situation uh, when we were treated at Springfield as uh, aware of a family and they were really having a hard time paying for different things. And God always took care of it. Like, we didn't have to go. Well, we don't have money to go to St. Louis. How are we going to drive there? Or we don't have uh, money to get our groceries. What are we going to do? Or we can't and that's pay for not because we're independently wealthy. I'm a minister. <laughs> <laughs> No, that was a God thing. I mean, God just raised up people who said, here's how we want to help. We even had some people privately tell us, and, and they never want us to tell anybody else that they did this. It was totally private, but that they would commit to give us, you know, this much a month until his treatment is done. And now we still have, I mean, we still have bills um, and stuff that we're paying on this, but I really, I, I think God was amazing then that in a church family, is important because if we didn't have a church family, I think that's where you get stuck. But everybody came around us, and God provided, so we we could focus on what was going on. And I and I think some people, um, unless you've been through this type of scenario with a child, um, having a child with cancer is expensive. Just to give you an example, the it's not your fault. which is not your fault at all. No. The uh, the helicopter ride, which no thought was the coolest thing. Um, was thirty nine thousand dollars. So, and that was that was the first day of his journey. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, people people that provided meals when we got home, um, it was such a blessing, you know, for someone to say, hey, I've got a casserole, can I bring it over? Um, because whenever you're you're walking through this journey, um, you know, quite honestly, people joke that that we'll never. We'll never sleep through the night because we always have we have five kids and but it's different between just being interrupted in your sleep and lying awake at night wondering what's going to happen next and so when you're just worn out um, to have people say hey I'll bring some food over or uh, you know here's here's a gift card go out go out we'll watch the kids for a few minutes you go eat someplace and just get away from from what's going on. So those are definitely ways that people help. Oh, that was a, a big deal. I think that happened just one, once or twice. We had a friend come over and said, I'm going to watch the kids. I want you guys to go. Here's some money. Go to a restaurant. Go eat out. Because we were not getting away just ourselves. Yeah. Well, and, and I'm going to brag on your pastor. Um, one day he and Melissa came over. Well, actually, they came to St. Louis in that first, first time we were up there. 
but uh, Travis and Melissa knew that we were going to be making lots of trips to St. Louis. Oh yeah, the DVD player. They brought us a in band DVD yes. player for the kids, and that was a man a lifesaver for all those trips we were making. So that was awesome. So give somebody a DVD player for their car <laughs> if they've got lots of trips, but it's very helpful. <laughs> This, by the way, is Noah. Yeah, this is Noah. One of the big helpers for me, mostly, was um, when I was in the treatment, it was an organization, mostly, but it's called Make-A-Wish. It's a organization devoted to help kids through, like, different illnesses, like if you have a brain injury, a tumor. Um, it gives you a ton of different stuff. Like, one of the biggest ones was it, two of the represent, res, representatives to the organization, they came to my house one day and asked me what I would like to, what my dream vacation or whatever would, would be. And so we went through the whole thing. And I'm a big Star Wars buff, so I um, <laughs> so I chose doing a Star Wars thing at Disney Disney um, Land in Florida, and they they took the whole thing. We didn't. Mom and Dad didn't have to pay a dime, and it was all free. And we got to um, last year in April. We right after Nathan's birthday, we got to go to. Disneyland for a whole week and do t different stuff. It was really fun. And and they also, when I was in, in 2011, in the uh, span where I was at the hospital just every day, they um, let me have a $200 gift card to Toys R Us. <laughs> Now that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's our shy child, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're so proud of him. Say. Here, you have my seat. Okay. okay. If, if you're not careful, yeah. I'll take him. <laughs> no, no, he's awesome. Kind of, we're gonna kind of bring this, and I really hate this because I'm. I was afraid I was going to run out of time. So what we may have to do is we may have to, I may just have to bring you back sometime just and either like have it extended where we video it and people can, you know, because I could, I could go on for like another hour. I mean, I really could. I mean, I, we could do it. <laughs> I don't, I don't lack for questions and, and I know that you have a lot that you, you could share. But as we kind of bring <clears throat> things to a, a close, I wanted to ask, first of all, um, there's one thing that you learned about God in this storm that you didn't know about him before you went into it. And then uh, any any other closing things that you really just wanted to share today that we didn't get to? Well, I'm kind of going to reiterate what I said earlier. I don't know that I've learned anything new about God that I didn't know beforehand, because I knew it. I just had to walk through it now. And I think that was, that was the huge difference. One thing I want to share real quick, another verse that um, I think this was like day three that Noah was in on the uh, pediatric ICU unit. Um, you know, have, have you ever kind of been at, a, been at a loss? Like, I don't know exactly, you know, I, I, I don't know what God wants to share with me today. I don't know where I need to read. I don't know where I can find the encouragement. And so I just flipped open to the Psalms. And it happened to fall into Psalm 121. And that verse starts out, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, Amen. the maker of heaven and earth. Amen. And that was an awesome reminder that, that uh, man, if God can create the universe, he can take care of cancer. Amen. Amen. Um, I know, kind of with Brian, I'm not sure what I learned knew about God, but it, just like him, just that everything that you have learned is true, and you can count on it, that he is there, and 
Um, it's hard, especially hard when we were watching Noah. There were times when he, the medicine affected him where he could not walk. He couldn't move sometimes and he didn't look like himself. Um, he was extremely uh, lethargic. I mean, just from the chemo, it just made him so sick. And it would be easy to say, well, you know, God must not care <laughs> about your child or whatever, but it, I just really felt like God was always reassuring us, I know what's happening and I'm allowing it, but, and I care greatly what's happening to you and it, it's going to be okay, just let me take it and we'll see what happens. And, and I also mentioned, and I want to mention, um, that I know it could have a different outcome. We saw a little bit after our journey, there's another family that was on Karen Bridge that um, we have connection to, Manette, and even if I, we had to get to a place where we'd say, even if, you know, God, if you decide that it's time for Noah to be with you, we're still going to walk through it. It's okay. We're going to trust you. Um, and their family had a different ending, which is not really an ending, but they have a different story. Um, and so even if you're going through things where it doesn't work out like you want it to, um, I just really felt like we knew uh, that God was there and um, just to trust him. You could trust him. You can trust him. Clap if you agree. God is awesome. <laughs> Do you consider yourself to be real life survivors? Absolutely. Amen. All right. Give them a great big hand in there. Well, we want to close today with the opportunity uh, to respond to anything that the Lord might be saying to your heart today. Again, Sometimes we know what God wants us to do, but sometimes living it, living it out, it's, it's difficult. Sometimes we don't do it. And so I want to invite you today just to, to live out, to do what, what God wants you to do. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, your hope is found in Jesus. There's hope for today, but there's hope for eternity in Jesus Christ. And so we invite you today to come to Him. I want to ask you to stand and, and just bow your heads and I want to have a word of prayer. I want to have a time of invitation. If you'd like to come, if you're going through a rough time and you'd like for us to pray with you today, we're here to do that. Father, we thank you so much for Brian and Delana and Noah. Thank you, Father, for their survivor story. We pray, Father, today that, that you have been lifted up. And I believe you have pray that today people have been drawn closer to Jesus because of their story. And I just pray that we would respond today to what you're saying to our hearts. For that person who has never trusted in you, I pray that today they would make that decision. For those who need to be prayed for because they're going through a difficult time, I pray that they would come and be comforted today by the prayers of other people. So have your way now, we pray, during this time of invitation. We just thank you again. You are a great God, and you're worthy to be praised.